With that in mind, let's talk about what God says to us about the Holy Communion and is valuable to us as a means of grace. I remember, and I tell you about this if you've read the chapter as Dr. Mark said he assigned it to you, when I heard Richard Wormbrand, a godly Lutheran pastor who has spent 14 years in a communist prison cell in Romania, he and his friends in isolation, tortured alone, in the early 1950s, when he was finally released, he told about the awful tortures that he had endured in a communist prison. <coughs> Some people didn't believe him until, while he was testifying before a house committee, he took off his shirt and showed the deep furrows of, of torture marks and scars across his back that he had suffered from being beaten in that communist prison cell for Christ. He later went on and formed an organization that's still thriving. You can find it on the web called uh, the Voice of the Martyrs, maybe you have heard that. And it keeps you very much aware of what's going on in this world so far as persecution is concerned. But I remember Dr. Wormbrand speaking that night and I felt like I was in the presence of a living martyr. As he talked to us of his own sufferings, there was a little school out in Nebraska where I was pastor, or near where I was a pastor, where he talked about how that in that prison cell under the ground in communist Romania, 14 years, he told, he said, me and my friends begin to experience what you and I, or what you folks in America never experience. We became hungry and thirsty for the body and blood of the Lord Jesus in the Holy Communion. And I've often thought about that. We Christians just don't take that seriously. In fact, the problem, the truth is that many of you come from churches where the communion is very rarely, if ever, celebrated. Am I right? I mean, it's something that doesn't happen very often. And when it does happen, maybe at Christmas time or Easter, but it's not a part of the regular worship of the church, as it was in the New Testament. If you look at my notes, and I hope that you will, the Holy Communion is very valuable, and the early Christians understood it that way. And that's why that in the earliest days of the Christian church, every Sunday you would celebrate the Lord's presence, first by the word, the preaching of the word, and also by the celebration of the Lord's Supper. It's an accident of history, I guess, that we have come to neglect the Lord's Supper on the days of the American frontier where our ancestors were, were out uh, in little settlements, many ministers, where there weren't, there weren't very many ministers around to celebrate the Lord's Supper. Gradually, it became neglected. But I want to talk to you, and there are five words I want to use today. It's a part of my lecture, and you've already read them, but I still want you to understand them. I want to put these five words on the board that tell the importance of the Lord's Supper. And the very first one is celebration. When we talk about the Lord's Supper, we're talking about a wonderful celebration. In a sense, the Lord's Supper is the church's feast of victory. In ancient times, a conqueror would return from the battle with his conquered enemies trailing behind his chariot before they were put to death. They were dragged through the streets as sort of a display. And a great dinner of victory, a great celebration was held, a feast, a banquet. And that's what the Lord's Supper is. The Lord's Supper is a feast of victory. The Lord's Supper is a feast. It's not a funeral for Jesus. As I quote from Dr. Rob L. States in, in my notes, uh, Dr. Staples, who is a Nazarene theologian, makes the comment, the Lord's Supper is a feast. It represents fiesta, not funeral. Keep that in mind, fiesta, not funeral. One of the reasons, perhaps, that people neglect the Lord's Supper, in some churches where it is done, it is done like a funeral for Jesus. It's a sad, dreary service sometimes with a lot of... And there's nothing wrong with weeping at the Lord's Supper. I wish I could weep every time I go to communion when I think about the Lord Jesus and his sacrifice for me. But I can't manipulate my emotions like that. You follow me? I, I can't do that. That would be a phony if I did. But it is a matter of celebration. As I've already pointed out, one of the earliest names for the Lord's Supper was the Eucharist. It means Thanksgiving. And it's when the church gathers together, ideally on a weekly basis, and certainly on a frequent basis, to celebrate God's victory for us. Sure, at the Lord's Supper, we remember the death of Christ. We're going to be talking about that with deepest gratitude. We remember our sins that drove him or brought him to the cross. All of that. But it's more than just the cross. Are you listening to me, kids? We see the cross 
Every Lord's Supper, the cross is bathed in the light from the empty tomb. You know Jesus did rise from the dead. You are aware of that, aren't you? Yes. That's why the early Christians celebrated Easter almost from the <coughs> earliest days. The oldest celebration of, 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 of feast days and festivals in the Christian church was not Christmas. Christmas didn't come along for, for years later. But it was Easter. Easter is still regarded as the greatest of all the Christian festivals. What happened at Easter? Jesus rose from the dead as the mighty conqueror over sin and death and hell. And at the Eucharist, yes, we see the cross. But we see the cross through the light of the empty tomb. And may I say, it is in the power of his resurrection that you have victory. That you have, you can't do it in yourself. All that you may try to do and not do is not enough. It's through the power of the risen Lord. And we celebrate that triumph at the Lord's Supper. Again, it's not funeral, but it's fiesta. We're not holding a funeral for a dead hero lying in a coffin and uh, weeping over his noble deeds and his great sacrifice. We are celebrating the greatest event that's ever taken place, and that is Jesus' triumph over sin and death. That's why we are told that in the early church, every Sunday was a little Easter. Every Sunday, the church was filled with light and grace and excitement. I remember reading the Roman novel written back in the 1940s about early Christians and the martyrs who went to their deaths. And it so impressed me that again and again, those people who were facing death, the lion's gory mane, the headsman's axe, all of these things, they were motivated by the power of the resurrection. We may die for Jesus, but if we do, we shall rise again. This is not the end. It's only the beginning. And so at the Lord's Supper, we see the cross, but it's always in the light of the empty tomb. We're not weeping over a dead hero, but we are celebrating the triumph of our risen Lord. And in the Lord's Supper, the risen Lord comes to us symbolically under the signs of bread and wine. I would to God that we could recapture the excitement of coming to the Lord's Supper, the early church. I have thought, kids, sometimes that we really understood how much those early Christians loved the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist. We would almost tumble over each other in getting down to the rail where we could receive the communion. Because there we celebrate the triumph of Jesus. One of the great hymns of the church, Horatius Boner, writes about the Lord's Supper, this is the hour of banquet and of song. You think about that. That's something more than a dreary funeral for Jesus. This is the hour of excitement. When we come to the communion service, we are celebrating Christ's victory. Victory! I don't care what happens, whatever happens in the last election. There, I, well, I care, I don't mean that. But whatever happens, I know who's going to win. And I know that we Christians have read the last chapter, right? Amen. Amen. And we celebrate his victory at the Lord's Supper. And so the Lord's Supper, first of all, is celebration. Secondly, the Lord's Supper is commemoration. This, by the way, I call the five C's of Holy Communion. The first one is celebration. Remember, as Dr. Staples said, it is fiesta, not funeral. Secondly, the Lord's Supper is celebration. And secondly, it is commemoration. Now, to commemoration, to commemorate, means to remember gratefully a past action in which somebody has made a valuable contribution. When you come up the, 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 you come up the ramp, you see a great big stone monument sitting there, right? How many of you ever noticed that monument? There are plaques. Have, how many of you noticed it? And have you ever noticed that on the bricks on the, on the floor, on the, on the area all around it, there are names of great people who have served at GBS? There's even one, there's even one, one brick out there with the name of the old horse that used to draw the wagons. That a kid like you would be appointed to take the eternity wagon downtown to get the mail. And so you had old Dobbin hooked up to the, to the horse. And can you imagine going down Liberty Hill down here, what that must have been like? And especially if you were the, if you were the student that were charged in, in, in driving old Dobbin with the Eternity Wagon, because the Eternity Wagon had, was, was a horse-drawn vehicle that had big signs on it. Where will you spend eternity? God's Bible School and College. And of course, all the guys in the town would get out and snicker and laugh and throw rocks at you. And... Uh, but uh, if you look out there, there's, a, there's actually 
uh, I can't even remember the name of the old horse right now, but there's a brick out there with his name. He led, oh, Tom, his name was Old Tom. You go out there and you'll see a brick that's dedicated to Old Tom who used to draw the eternity wagon. He had a special stable. There was a, used to be a wooden tabernacle, a big wooden church that sat right there in front of the girls' dawn, dorm, right over here. And tacked onto the back of it was Old Tom's Hotel, which was simply his stable where he was kept. Well, we commemorate, we remember Old Tom, we remember famous people that have been here on this campus. We thank God for his gracious deeds. We thank God for the, your parents celebrate their wedding anniversaries. You celebrate your birthday. We celebrate all we remember. That's to commemorate. Are you with me? We commemorate. That monument out there was raised in, 19, in the, year, uh, the year 2000 to commemorate 100 years of faithful service of people who have gone all over the world as missionaries from this tiny little hilltop campus and that stone. Go out there and read the plaques. Read the names. They're only a tiny fraction. But it's raised to the glory of God to commemorate to remember. Now the bread and wine also help us to commemorate. When we take the cup, we remember the shed blood of the Lord Jesus, right? We remember that it was by His blood that we are, that we, we have eternal life. And so the scriptures say, the, this is my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. When we break the bread, the body of the Lord Jesus. In other words, we are remembering the bread and wine are sacred symbols that remind us powerfully of Jesus' sacrifice upon the cross. But when we talk about this, it's not merely memorial in a past action, but as Dr. Harper, your textbook author, says, in, in our understanding of this, the past becomes present, and for a little moment as you come to communion, you're at Calvary again. You're there for a moment. The centuries pass away. You're there you see the sunlight glinting on the armor of the Roman soldiers. You hear them rattling the dice over his clothing. You look up into the face of three men dying on three crosses. And you hear the words of agony that fall from the lips of the sufferer nailed to the center cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And you realize it was all for you. It was all for me. Our whole hope is in the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And we are commemorating that. We are remembering this with gladness. And so in a sense, every time we come to the Lord's table, we are, we are celebrating drama, sacred drama. The same word that the pastor preaches from the pulpit, Christ's death and resurrection. The same message that we are preaching with words in the pulpit, we are celebrating, we are renewing, we are dramatizing at the Lord's table and the bread and the wine. It's the same gospel. Bread and wine reminding us of the body and blood of the Lord Jesus. Thus the Eucharist, the Lord's Supper, is the great preacher of Jesus, the wonderful remembrancer of Him. Think of Christ. Again, at the Lord's table, the centuries pass away. You are at Calvary. You are there. And you look, look up into the face of dying love. And you can say in the words of the old hymn, When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and pour contempt on all my pride. Did e'er such love and sorrow meet? Or thorns compose so rich a crown? And so at Calvary then, as I am at the Eucharist, I look up into the face of my Lord Jesus, who died for me. And I cry out as did Thomas, my Lord <coughs> and my God. And so thus, as the St. Paul says, at the Lord's table, we are proclaiming the Lord's death until his coming again. I am declaring to you as I take the bread and the wine, I am declaring to, to, to each other, and we are declaring to God and to the angels and to everyone, our only hope is in Christ, right? He is our only hope. 